Welcome back to the research stage, everyone. Next up is a session on a topic which has become one of the most important issues related to the internet and social media, online hate. Many think that technology can help us monitor and fight it, but as we'll hear from our next speakers, it's not so cut and dry. AI tools aren't as effective as we think. This session is curated with the Alan Turing Institute. Welcome to our speakers, Bernie and Paul. The floor is yours. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, my name is Paul Rotka. I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Oxford, and I also work with the Alan Turing Institute as a research assistant on this project that we're mostly here to talk to you about today. And the title of our presentation is uh, Weaknesses of AI Tools for Detecting Online Hate. Here with me is my colleague Bertie, and I'll pass it on to him now. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. So my name is Dr. Bertie Vigin. I'm a research fellow in online harms at the Alan Turing Institute and also a visiting researcher at the University of Oxford. Now, if we, uh, if we go straight to the presentation, we can have a look at um, our deck. Brilliant, there we go. So um, the project that all of this work comes out of is called Hate Speech Measures and Countermeasures. And this is a project in the Turing's public policy program. Our mission is to work with policymakers and regulators to use cutting edge data science and AI to improve the provision of public services. And in this project in particular, we're measuring, analyzing and countering online hate speech with advanced computational methods. And I think this is really useful to give some grounding to the research that Paul's gonna talk about in more detail later. So there are three things that we draw on. First of all is social science, because you can't look at something like online hate without engaging with social concepts, frameworks, theories, and often very contentious and subjective normative decisions. The second is machine learning, because the sheer scale and variety and speed at which online content is created means that you have to use statistical and computational techniques if you're going to get through it all. The third thing is policy. There's some absolutely amazing research which happens across UK and international institutions, but often it doesn't get into the hands of the people who really need it. People are on the front lines trying to develop policies and interventions and regulation to tackle online hate. But what is online hate? Well, it probably won't surprise you that online hate is incredibly contested and, con and contentious. It's a very subjective concept. Uh, you can't just go straight to a dictionary and get the first definition and think that solves the problem. Nearly any expert that you ask will have a slightly different definition. Um, and there's really fundamental disagreement about what online hate is. However, whilst we do a lot of work on those uh, very important scholarly debates and points of disagreement, at some point you have to just define what you're studying and what you're trying to tackle. So for us, online hate speech is a communication on the internet which expresses prejudice against an identity. Online hate speech can take the form of derogatory, demonizing and dehumanizing statements, threats, identity-based insults, pejorative terms and slurs. Now, in practice, it would involve four things. So a medium for the content, such as text, images, video, audio, and GIFs, a perpetrator, so that's someone who creates or shares the hateful content, an actual or potential audience, so this is anyone who is or who could be exposed to or targeted by the hate, and then a communicative setting. So where is it taking place? Is it in a big broadcast style social media platform, a private messaging app, an online forum or something else? And we really need to know all these four things. If anyone's ever talking to you about online hate and they don't give this sort of clarity around the, the, the particulars of how it's being expressed, you're gonna miss a really important part of the picture. And if we know what online hate is, I guess the question is, why should we be concerned about it? What's the problem? What are we trying to solve when we take steps to counter online hate? Well, online hate inflicts harm in a range of ways. And in our work, we split it into three areas. So first of all, the direct effects on victims. They experience immediate emotional distress. They can have long-term mental health challenges, long-term effects on their behavior, and a lack of willingness to engage in public life. So we've spoken to victims of Islamophobia who have said that they don't even want to leave the house because they're so scared of these online attacks translating into the real world and them suffering from physical abuse. There's also lots of indirect types of harm which we see from online hate. So linked with offline attacks and online attacks, and often they're very insidious. The, the impact of online hate is not always incredibly obvious and tangible. It can be much more diffuse and wide ranging. The final thing is societal effects. So 
Online hate raises fundamental questions of social fairness and justice. And if we don't do enough to tackle online hate, we have to ask ourselves about the character of our society. But that said, we also have to recognize the other side of this picture, which is that yes, we need to take steps to tackle the harm that's inflicted by online hate, but we need to make sure that we're still protecting people's freedom of speech. We need surgically incisive tools that we just remove the hate speech and we leave everything else. And we leave all the content which might look very similar to hate speech. It might be stuff which is slightly offensive or distasteful or things which we're not particularly happy at online. However, if they don't cross the line into hate, if they don't meet our definition and our criteria and our requirements, then we should be leaving them online to make sure that people's freedom of expression is protected at all times. And it turns out there's some really big challenges in online hate. So it's, this, this is an area that has received so much attention in the last couple of years. And, and just last month, we saw the release of the online safety bill from the UK government and the announcement a couple of months ago that Ofcom would be the new online harms regulator. This is an absolute sea change in how we tackle harmful online content. It's, it's a very new research area. We're only talking about, say, 10 years of really detailed research, which means that there are some really fundamental things we just don't know that much about and some real big challenges that we have to address. So online hate is contentious, it's subjective, it's contextual. It's very difficult to define and to articulate exactly what we mean by online hate. This means that it's incredibly hard to find. And one of the challenges is that online hate is actually quite rare. So a lot of people have been exposed to hate and affected by hate. But if you look at how much uh, of, of online content actually comprises hate, it's probably around a percent of a percent. It's incredibly rare. The third thing is that this means that it's very difficult to assess and monitor volume. We don't have standardized ways of measuring and evaluating hate. This makes it hard to do the monitoring that's needed. Fourth, the impact of online hate is diffuse and insidious and also hard to evaluate. It's not always just as simple as saying, did this cause someone really serious emotional harm? Did this result in physical violence? There's lots of other challenges with hate that we need to think about and reflect on. Um, and then five, we know relatively little about the dynamics and causes. We know, for example, that terrorist attacks have a huge impact in triggering a lot of hate speech. We also know that people's social networks have a big impact. So if you're connected to other people who are hateful, if you're having interactions, and if you're normalizing hate speech, that can motivate, that can encourage you or lead you to engage in more hate speech yourself. But we still don't know as much about it as we need to to create really good policy and really good interventions. And then finally, many targets of hate are just not studied at all, or they're completely under-researched. And this was really thrown into the spotlight during COVID. Uh, we, we've done a lot of work building artificial intelligence tools to detect online hate speech. And there were no tools available at the start of the pandemic, either commercially or in academia or in government, um, to detect East Asian prejudice and Sinophobia. But of course, with COVID, that became an incredibly important issue. We actually did a rapid response. We built a, an artificial intelligence tool which can detect um, East Asian prejudice, and that's now publicly available and published in a research paper. But huge areas of online hate just have not been researched whatsoever. But we're here to talk today about the second challenge. Online hate is really hard to find. And so um, artificial intelligence is increasingly used as a solution to nearly any problem. So if you have a problem, throw some artificial intelligence at it. It'll sound good, hopefully it'll work, and you might be able to make some progress. But why do we actually want to use AI? What, what's the clear rationale and the clear reason for doing so? Well, with online hate, it's very straightforward. The challenge is scale. There's way too much online content for us to have human moderators going through and checking stuff. It's not time efficient, it's not cost efficient, and it's also not socially efficient. So if we have human moderators checking content, whether it contains hate, um, they, they are themselves being exposed to huge amounts of hate speech, and that's not a desirable thing. We can use AI, we can save those people from being exposed to harm. So thanks for listening. I'm gonna hand back over to Paul, who can talk about our latest research on this topic. Thank you, Bertie. And I'll take right over where you left off, which is that, as you said, over the last five to 10 years, people have recognized that we need AI in content moderation systems to detect online hate at scale. But so far, we had a very limited understanding of how good AI systems actually are at detecting online hate. So when these new tools were being developed, 
usually they would be evaluated on a fairly small set of academic benchmark data sets that researchers had collected from social media platforms such as Twitter and annotated by hand to contain hateful and non-hateful examples. And then a model would do good on these benchmark data sets. It would, have to, it would be seen to have kind of a high quality, high accuracy and high usefulness in detecting online hate. However, increasingly, we recognize that there are clear limitations to this kind of approach, to this reliance on this small set of benchmark data sets. First, we know that accuracy metrics alone don't really tell us much about the granular uh, quality of these models, of these AI tools that we want to test. So if we have a tool that is 93% accurate on a particular data set rather than just 91%, we only have a very abstract sense of this tool having somehow gotten more useful or better for the thing that we care about, which is protecting online communities by detecting this, uh, this online hate at scale. The second thing is that increasingly it's been well documented that the benchmark data sets that have been used have clear, glaring, systematic gaps and biases. As I said, they were sampled from specific platforms and particularly from Twitter at very specific times. Often they were collected by using certain keywords to search for content and those keyword lists are incomplete and biased in their own way. And then everything that was found was shown to human moderators who may or may not have been trained particularly well in what is and isn't hate, um, who then kind of brought their own biases to these data sets by making the decisions on whether a given piece of content in them is or isn't hateful. So for us, that kind of led us to ask, how can we better understand the more detailed, more granular strengths and weaknesses of these AI tools for detecting online hate? And we tried to answer that in our article, Hate Check, a suit of functional tests for hate speech detection models. So this is joint work. Uh, that Bertie and I led on together with four other researchers from the University of Oxford, Utrecht University, and the University of Sheffield. And the idea was that by creating a test suit where each test corresponds to a particular kind of hate or kind of challenging non-hate, we could get more targeted diagnostic insights into what these models can and cannot do well. And in the next 15 minutes or so, I will give you an overview of how we built HateCheck what resources went into it, what kind of content we are testing in there, what the test cases look like, and then also what models we actually tested in our research, um, both academic models and commercial models, and what that revealed about those models. So the first thing we did in building Hate Check was we spoke to civil society stakeholders. Uh, particularly, we spoke to 21 NGO workers who work for organizations that directly um, relate to online hate in some way or form. So a lot of them provided uh, support or legal advocacy for the people who were often targeted by online hate. Uh, they had trusted flagger status with the large social media platforms that meant that they were actively engaging and kind of supporting the content moderation uh, for hate targeted against the communities that they represent. Um, they represented a wide variety of communities that were often targeted by online hate, such as the Muslim community, Jewish community. Um, and we spoke to them because we wanted to get their perspective as experts in interacting with these content moderation systems, what they felt the strengths and weaknesses of those models uh, that were used in practice were. So we would ask them about uh, what kinds of content that they felt in their experience with these systems uh, these systems were getting wrong, the AI was getting wrong. Um, we asked them what they would think the qualities of a better, you know, a utopian detection model in a way would be unbounded by technical or financial constraints. And based on that, we then tried to uh, develop functional tests that tested for that kind of content to see wh how well models were doing at uh, detecting hate in it. So for example, a lot of the people we interviewed mentioned counter speech, which is the practice of essentially calling out hate, denouncing it um, in direct opposition to it. So taking a stand online saying this is not okay. And a lot of this kind of counter speech might actually reproduce certain elements of the original hateful statement. So I might call someone a bigot for using a certain slur, 
But then the slur is still in that counter speech statement. And what the people we interviewed often found, several of them mentioned to us, is that when they tried to engage in that kind of counter speech, then their content as well was being taken down falsely um, as being hate speech. The second set of resources that we went to was uh, the like increasingly large amount of uh, research in this space. So over the last five years, especially, there's been a lot of work on online hate and its automated detection using AI tools. In particular, we looked at different types of hate that people had kind of separated in taxonomies of abusive content so that we could include a diverse set of uh, hateful statements in our test suit. We also looked at previous error analyses. So these were usually mostly heuristic approaches where people had built models and then on a, based on a small set of the errors that they made on the benchmark data sets that I mentioned, they would hypothesize about likely model weaknesses. Um, one example, for instance, is that we know that a lot of models are overly sensitive to group identifiers. So a term like gay, as in gay people, uh, models might falsely think that any mention of such a term would constitute hate speech because in the training data sets that they were trained on, uh, the, this term mostly appeared in hateful contexts. And that's, of course, a real issue when we then take these models out into the real world where the word gay is used in many, almost mostly used in non-hateful contexts. So we took those insights and based on them, we created 29 functional tests where each functional test is essentially a small data set of clearly hateful or clearly non-hateful statements. 18 tests were for distinct expressions of hate. So this goes back to what I said about different kinds of uh, hateful content that we identified in taxonomies of hate. And 11 tests were for contrastive non-hate. Contrastive meaning that they resembled hateful statements in some key ways, but themselves, they were clearly non-hateful. And that makes them very challenging to models that rely on overly simplistic decision rules, perhaps, that don't really encode a true def understanding of what is and isn't hate, but rather just look for signals um, that these contrasts would then reveal. I've given an example here of three cases uh, out of the 3,728 in total that are in hate check. On the left, you can see the hateful case, and on the right, in blue, the corresponding non-hateful contrast. I'm not going to read them out here, just the first one. Um, we have this very blunt and clear hateful statement, I hate identity, where identity is a placeholder for the protected groups that we uh, included in the hate check article. And on the right, too, corresponding to it, we have a clear contrast where there is hate expressed in, in the kind of semantic sense, but this hate is targeted at an object. It's targeted at food, at pizza. Um, this is clearly not hate speech. So a, an overly naive model might get confused by such a contrast, thinking that all kinds of hate are hate speech. With this kind of contrast, we would reveal such weaknesses. So once we finished building and validating HateCheck by showing all test cases to a team of trained annotators and validating the data quality and the clarity of the labels that we assigned to each of the test cases, we then wanted to put it to the test and to demonstrate its practical utility. And we did that by taking four current academic and commercial models and applying them to HateCheck specifically we took two BERT models. So these are, uh, that's kind of the name of this neural architecture. I've uh, symbolized them here with these two BERT heads. Uh, they were trained on two widely used academic data sets for hate speech detection. So they really represented kind of around the state of the art of the academic uh, literature on hate speech detection at the moment. And then, perhaps more interestingly, we also tested two commercial models, uh, widely used ones that were developed by large companies for the purposes of content moderation. So specifically, we looked at Google Jigsaw's Perspective and Sift Ninja, which was developed by Two Hat, one of the world's largest content moderation companies. And I should say that we picked those four as kind of current examples. 
but generally HEC can be used for testing any kind of model that uh, can provide a binary prediction on whether something is hateful or not hateful based on a piece of text. What we found when we applied the models to HEC is that all of them have critical weaknesses. Specifically, all of them are clearly and overly sensitive to certain keywords in at least some contexts. For example, the models all perform quite well on detecting hate that is expressed with hateful slurs. So when a hateful slur is used in a hateful context, the models generally recognize that this is indeed hateful, and that's good. However, they then also think that non-hateful reclaimed users of those same slurs, thinking of the N-word, for instance, are also hateful. So when slurs are, when these potentially hateful slurs are used in context that makes them clearly non-hateful, even then the models think, oh, this is a slur, so this must be hate speech. Perspective, for instance, a Google Jigsaw's model has a 71.6% error rate on our functional test for reclaimed slurs. Relatedly, all models are overly sensitive to certain key phrases. So this is kind of a similar phenomenon, but rather than specific words, we now have entire phrases that can be reframed into being clearly non-hateful, but that isn't recognized by the models. So the examples here are counter speech, which I already outlined what that is, and then negated hate, uh, where we would have statements like, no identity deserves to die, where the no makes it very clear that this is not a hateful statement, the negation kind of introducing the phrase, but then the phrase after on its own would clearly be hateful. And that really fooled all models that we tested at an incredibly high rate. So again, the example of perspective, that has a 96.2% error rate on our test cases for negated hate. And lastly, we saw that the academic models in particular, so the two BERT models, they were very biased in their target coverage. And by that, we mean that they performed fairly well for some groups. So for instance, for hate targeted at gay people, they would perform fairly well but then they would perform much worse for the same kind of hateful statements, excuse me, targeted at other groups. So for instance, targeted at women. Now, hate check makes these model weaknesses very clear, but they only become critical when we think about how these AI tools are actually used in practice. In particular, when we think about an AI tool with these weaknesses being used for content moderation. In that case, such a flawed AI model can create very, very concrete harms. If we think about reclaimed slurs, which are reclaimed often by the communities that are targeted by hate to begin with, if that was additionally then flagged as hate speech, not only would we fail to protect those communities, but we would even harm them further by further censoring their positive reclaimed users of, of those slurs. If we misclassify counter speech as hate speech, then we are actively undermining the positive efforts that are meant to fight hate speech and to reduce its spread and essentially clearing the way for actual hate to, to spread online. Lastly, if we deploy models that have these clear target biases, biases in target coverage, then we would be reinforcing the kinds of biases that we already see in how different communities are protected in the online spaces that we want to moderate. Now, we didn't only want to criticize with hate check, but we also wanted to open up a conversation about how we can build better models that address these weaknesses. And the positive message that I want to emphasize is that there is a lot of research being done in terms of addressing these weaknesses, but also generally in terms of building better AI tools for hate detection. And I want to highlight some streams of work here that. Uh, also, the, the Turing Institute and the, the HAMS project is actively involved in. In the context of hate check, one of the clearest approaches for building better AI tools for hate detection is to improve the quality of the data sets that we train the AI models on. 
So an AI model cannot really recognize that reclaimed slurs are a thing unless it's seen reclaimed slur users in its training data. So it will think that all slur users are hateful if all it's seen are hateful users of slurs. So one way of working towards a fix for uh, the kinds of weaknesses we identified is to create better data sets in terms of diversity of language in them, diversity of hateful content in them. They have to be larger so that they cover more of these potentially edge cases. They have to be more balanced. So as Bertie alluded to, hate is in absolute terms quite a rare phenomenon. But to effectively train an AI model, they do need to see quite a lot of different um, kinds of hateful content. And also, it's good for these data sets to be more challenging to the AI. So going back to the idea of contrasts, training a model on both I hate identity and I hate pizza teaches it that it's not only about the hate, but it's about who the hate is targeted against. So these kind of more challenging data sets are one clear way forward for building better AI tools. Relatedly, there's the issue of how we train the model. So a lot of academic research is naturally quite static, where we look at one data set and we work towards one publication. There's a conference deadline, turnover, um, and then the field kind of moves on. In practice, content moderation and hate detection is a very dynamic challenge. It constantly evolves. There's new language that emerges, new hateful uh, tropes that emerge. So Bertie alluded to the COVID pandemic and the rise that we saw in anti-East Asian hate. So we will need to build processes that are more naturally dynamic and able to be updated with the latest changes in hateful language. And some of that may be achieved also by including more of a human element in the training loop itself. So constantly challenging the models again and again throughout the training process, um, giving more human guidance to, in it so that we build more robust and more um, dynamic models. Another challenge, as Bertie has also highlighted initially, is that hate can depend quite heavily on context. It doesn't always do. There's a lot of hate that is very unambiguous in just a simple text statement. But a lot of it can be quite dependent on conversational context, on social context, the identity of the author and the audience. It can be dependent on the temporal context. When was this said? In relation to which events was this said? And there's definitely still a challenge in academia and industry to build the kind of models that can take into account these extra linguistic contexts, as you would say. Further, we have in HateCheck focused on text hate, text-based hate, and most research so far has. But of course, online, Hate takes many different forms. It can uh, take the form of images, memes, audio, video, and any combination of those modalities. And models need to be developed that actually recognize hate in those modalities as well. Lastly, most academic research has focused on English language hate. And commercial solutions also tend to focus first on English language because they have commercial interests in covering as much of a potential audience as possible initially. But of course, hate is a phenomenon that exists in any language on Earth. So we will need to develop models that also account for that fact and that are able to detect hate effectively in any language that is uh, spoken online. To summarize, then, some of the key points of today's talk, as Bertie kind of led with, it is very clear that we need AI tools for detecting online hate at scale to uh, get a handle on the insane amounts of content that I put on the internet every day, but also to protect the moderators that otherwise have to sift through this uh, and potentially experience harm. But so far, these AI tools, we, knew, we kind of vaguely knew that they were flawed, but we didn't have a very specific understanding of what their strengths and weaknesses actually were, because we were too reliant on benchmark data sets with very known gaps and biases. With HeadCheck, we tried to address that problem by enabling more targeted diagnostic insights through having these separate functional tests that each relate to a particular kind of hate or challenging non-hate. And what we found when we tested current models, both academic and commercial models with HeadCheck, is that these models all have critical weaknesses. In particular, 
in relation to how sensitive they are to certain keywords, such as slurs or key phrases. And these kind of weaknesses, when we think about how AI tools are actually applied, risk creating very concrete harms to online communities. Again, thinking of the may maybe two most illustrative examples, uh, the, over the misclassification of reclaimed slurs is hateful, and the misclassification of counter speech is hateful, both of which risk penalizing the communities that are targeted by online hate and undermining the, the efforts that are uh, trying to fight hate speech online. In sum, we clearly need better AI, better AI tools that don't have these flaws and that aren't limited in many of the other ways that we've outlined, whether it's language coverage or modalities, image-based uh, abuse. All of this constitutes an open research question. However, as I said, and to end on a more positive note, building those models is possible. So there's already a lot of research and research progress in these areas by a wide and diverse variety of, of researchers all over the world that are actively working on developing these kinds of models. And we hope with HCheck that we can essentially provide one step on this ladder towards better AI. So thank you to, to Bertie for uh, co-hosting this talk to me. And thank you for the Turing Institute and COGEX for inviting us to talk about our research. And with that, I would like to conclude the presentation part and go over into the Q&A. Brilliant. Well, well, thank you for that. Um, actually, the, the first question that we have in the Q&A is actually one that um, I'm going to address myself, because someone has asked, um, could you elucidate more on the fact that hate is experienced very often, but supposedly it does not occur as a large percentage of content, because the two things seem a little antithetical. Well, this is actually a really interesting point, and it's the fact that if you look at uh, survey data on the percentage of people who report being exposed to and targeted by and affected by hate, it's 30, 40 percent of people. Some surveys put it even higher. And if you look at certain groups, um, like black people or gay people or people who are generally more likely to be targeted by online hate, the percentage can go up to 70 or 80 percent. However, those are very rare occurrences. It's just that even if it happens to you only once, even if all that happens to you in, in say, a year is that you get one bit of content targeting you, out of the thousands, if not tens of thousands of bits of content you might see in a day, um, that can have a huge impact on you. And that really stays with people and really affects them and impacts on their well-being. So even though it's incredibly rare as a percentage of all the content, even those very rare occur occurrences are having a lot of impact on people. And so a lot of people are still being affected. But this is one of the paradoxes that we're always dealing with in online hate. Um, and this is why you can have people who just say, well, it doesn't really exist. You know, like we never see online hate. Um, and the, and the reality is that, that it is still there and it is still affecting people. Um, I actually have a question for you, Paul, which is, so it seems like um, you know, in the work we did, we identified a lot of challenges in online hate detection models. I guess the, the real question is, what do we do now? What's the, what's the next step? We've identified all the problems. How do we translate into something positive to try and address and, and solve this problem? Yeah, thank you. I, I think I try to kind of allude to that towards the end of the presentation in terms of the streams of research that are ongoing towards building better detection models. And certainly, in particular, for the kinds of weaknesses that we identified, a likely solution, if not a complete solution, but at least a step in the right direction would be to augment and expand and improve the quality of the data sets that we train AI tools for hate detection on because those tools are really only as good as the data that they learn from, that they try to learn from what is and isn't hateful. So as I said, if they've never really seen a particular kind of hate or a particular kind of non-hate, it's very difficult for them to generalize to those uh, kinds of content. So by thinking very critically about how we curate the data that we use for training AI tools, we can improve their coverage avoid a lot of the biases that we see in their application currently um, by yeah essentially in in their development so way before the deployment stage excellent we've had another question which is how do we account for researchers different perceptions and sensitivities towards online hate because one person's perception of online hate is going to be very different from the next and so what's the influence say of our perceptions of hate on the research on the production of something like hate check 
Yeah, I think that's a brilliant question and uh, that relates quite closely to the difficulties that Bertie mentioned at the beginning of our talk in regards to just pinning down people on definitions of what they do and do not consider hate speech. Um, certainly not all kinds of abuse are hate speech and not all kinds of content um, that maybe we wouldn't want to see on the internet are necessarily hateful as well. As researchers, it's very important that we make clear any of this, the assumptions we make, and we try to do that in hate check. So to be very specific about this is the definition of hate that we're operating with. These are the guidelines that we showed to the annotators when they were validating uh, our test suit. And these are the limitations maybe in terms of coverage. You know, We only included so many protected groups we didn't, for example, include intersectional characteristics, which is a whole um, other set of identities that, that future research might consider. So as researchers, I think it's, it's really just our duty to be very explicit about the assumptions we make and the limitations of our work. And then other people can take issue with that, but then there's a dialogue going rather than us being coy about the assumptions we're making and then people just disagreeing on principle. That makes sense. And I, I suppose also to, the thing with hate check is that it was intentionally fairly straightforward, simple statements because you wanted to identify, you know, what, what are the limitations of a, of a bad model rather than this means that your model is amazing because it did well on hate check. Um, we've also had some really interesting questions around uh, the role of government and platforms in moderating and tackling online hate. So I was wondering if you could comment um, on the role of the platforms in moderating hate speech and the role of government perhaps in setting regulation and policy making around this area. Yeah, I think this is something that uh, your group at the Turing also has done a lot of good work on, which is this, there's, there's a trend generally of government slightly reasserting itself over platforms in terms of what kind of content is and isn't allowed on the internet. Platforms still have a lot of discretion about how they formulate their community guidelines. And we certainly see big, a, a large diversity in the kinds of content that are allowed on some plot platforms and not others. So there are still these more fringe social media platforms that under the guise of free speech allow very, very hateful statements to um, be propagated on them. Platforms like 4chan, Gab, um, and Parler and similar. Uh, so they are still the ones who are tasked with moderating content uh, on their sites. So they play a very central role in um, moderating hate speech at the moment. And they are the ones who are building the kinds of system that employ AI and human moderation to then make decisions about what content is and isn't on their platform. But as I alluded to, increasingly government is reasserting itself and setting the more general frameworks about maybe where the harder lines are drawn in terms of what, what can and cannot be on these platforms. But again, I think, uh, Bertie, you might have some additional insights on the UK uh, legal situation in particular. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're seeing a sea change in how we tackle this sort of content with things like the new online safety bill and Ofcom taking more power. And I suppose the, the reality is that a lot of hate speech is not illegal. And actually, the laws around hate are incredibly ill-defined. Um, we don't really have any laws specifically targeted for online hate, even after all this time. So going to the law is not really a very good answer. It means that increasingly, platforms are having to take down things and moderate content, which is legal, but still harmful. And that's very tricky. So the, the kind of answer at the moment seems to be to get platforms to be more precise and transparent in what they're taking down and why. And then it's down to a user if they want to be on a platform, which still could contain quite a lot of hate, like the new sites. Um, we're coming almost to the end of the time, so I think there's, there's a really interesting couple of questions here about some of the more technical challenges um, of building AI. Uh, and I'll just, I'll just throw two of them at you, Paul, and you can give your thoughts. So one is around changes in vernacular and ways of talking, and how, how can we build AI to take that into account and address the fact that language changes and, and there's always movement? The other is around how do we take into account context? Um, and, how, and how do we handle different contexts and different settings in which these tools might be applied? Yeah, so these are two of the biggest challenges, I would say, in, in both commercial and academic uh, development of, of those AI tools. So let me first start with context. Um, the, the notion of context is a very broad one, and we can think of context in many different ways. I've highlighted some of them in the presentation. We can think of context as this is a comment that's replying to other comments or to some posts. Those are kind of the conversational context. But we can also think of context as 
This is the social setting in which this interaction is taking place. These are two friends talking to each other. These are people who have never met each other. So first, all of kind of all, all the technical approaches to this issue need to define what kind of context they are concerned with. If we take, for example, conversational context, there is increasingly much work on this. So in fact, Bertie, uh, you led on, on a recent paper um, the contextual abuse data set where uh, you try to essentially include these conversational contexts and in the annotation of what is and isn't hate, think about is this hate clear based on the comment alone or do we need to see the comment in the context of the conversation to um, say whether this is hateful or not. And we need those kind of data sets to build models that can then look at conversational context and make decisions about whether something is or isn't hateful based on that. But adding these contextual components also adds complexity to the challenge of putting together the training data sets because we not only need that one statement to annotate but we need the full conversation and if we think of something like social context not only is that a practical challenge of how do we survey um, the different kinds of social context but also a privacy challenge of you know, can we actually collect the kind of data, the kind of social data? Would we want to collect the kind of social data that would be necessary to uh, train a fully context aware model? And then just very, very briefly, because we do want to wrap up after this on the question of dynamic models, there it's really important to continuously retrain the model because we see that language changes a lot based on events, based on topical shifts. Um, hateful language in particular is very event driven and changes a lot, jargon, these kind of memes, they emerge within days. So uh, in practical applications in particular, it's just very important to continuously go back and test the model based on current data and then retrain it with current data and make sure that um, this problem, which we will never fully solve, we at least don't get worse at over time. Yeah, and I, I suppose that's a challenge that it's, it's always an arms race. So we need to keep making progress just to stand still, which is why it's it's so difficult. Um, but I, th I think we have come to the end of the time. So really just, just for me to say thank you uh, to COGX for having us. Thank you to everyone who asked questions. These are really, really great questions, which really do get to the heart of the social and the technical challenges of tackling online hate. Um, I just I just add that if anyone is interested in finding out more, we, we have a very full, busy research program at the Turing. Uh, you're very welcome to reach out to me, and I'd, I'd really happy to talk about this more and introduce you to our work. Um, Paul, anything? Yeah, final? thank you also from my side uh, to Cogex, to the Turing for hosting this. Thank you to all the people who ask questions, uh, really great and interesting questions. And I wish we had more time to to answer some of them, but. If you do want to get in touch with us to talk more about our work, please do um, either via email or on Twitter. Um, and, and we're very keen to kind of engage on this further. Thanks uh, again for this really great primer on how AI and data science are being used to monitor, detect, and prevent online hate. You both have made it crystal clear that technology both enables online hate, but also can fight it through AI modeling, data science, and computational techniques, so thank you. Thanks to our audience for joining this session. Feel free to explore the virtual expo booths and networking area during the break. And don't forget to share your findings on social media using the hashtag COGX2021. A quick reminder that the next session on the research stage will be about sustainability in Africa and will start at 3 p.m.